This is the Day More NBA podcast brought to you by the Genesis Company coming at you Friday night. It's December 8th. Uh, we're doing this one live on YouTube right after the Wolves win in Memphis by 23. I got Kyle Tige here with me for the next hour. We're going to talk about this win. I, I takes a sip of wine. <laughs> uh, their 16th win, Kyle, in the last 18 games. Uh, we'll talk about this team being 17 and four now, about a quarter of the way through the season. Uh, we were talking earlier today. We want to talk a little bit about the schedule ahead, which definitely gets a lot tougher than Charlotte, San Antonio, Memphis that it's been uh, for these last three games. Uh, we've got Cooper Carlson uh, monitoring the comments section, doing the production. So we're going to take some questions from those of you live here in the chat. Yeah. All right. Let's do this. Kyle, how are you? Dan, I'm three games away, three wins away from just going shirtless in the pool and doing the LeBron pick where it's like, I can't believe this is my life. Like I can't, I can't believe this is my life. Uh, 17 and four. I don't know. You said what? 16 and two in their last 18, whatever, like uh, 17 and four in their last 21. Uh, yeah. They're incredible. And tonight was just another one of those nights. I mean, you can't talk about wolves Grizzlies on a Friday night without probably starting at the top and being like Anthony Edwards hit yeah. pointer. I'm sure we can get into that more, but he exits after four minutes, didn't really record a stat other than an assist. And after a couple minutes of just kind of adjusting or kind of feeling it out, all right, just next man up, Troy Brown Jr., Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Nas Reed off the bench. Like, the depth, the things we talked about in September and all summer, the depth, the continuity, and you're starting to see this trust level and this alignment of one goal. Everyone's been paid now, right? Everyone's gotten all that other stuff out of the way. Everyone just shows up trying to win a game and they've won 17 of them. So I know Memphis isn't the Memphis Grizzlies that we're still scarred from, from a couple of years ago, but it's a different Memphis team than they played, I don't know, a week and a half ago. They have a little more fight to them and the Wolves did what they've been doing every night now. Lean on a team, lean on a team, third quarter punch, early fourth quarter knockout, and now Luca Garza checks in. <laughs> um, it I, I did find myself like just thinking about the the ant injury and just kind of mostly the the positive part of it because I I don't think this is going to be an injury that lingers right this isn't right. like a, a hamstring thing that's going to reaggravate itself into like an extended uh, stretch of time that he'll be out for at least I don't think so um, and and just thinking about how good this team is without ant I mean I think to be fair he gets hurt in the Thunder game. And then misses games against you know lesser opponents in Utah and Charlotte. Comes back for the Spurs game as clearly a you know a fraction of himself. Um, they're able to win that game too, and, and the Grizzlies. So I mean, it's been an easy stretch of the schedule. It's kind of been the perfect time to have Ant uh, be hurt. But you know, those are games that if you lose them because Ant is Ant is hurt, you know, you're you're looking back a month or two from now, and you're like man, we lost to the Grizzlies or to the Spurs or whatever. And we've been talking throughout this week a little bit. And I was like, yeah, I don't know, like maybe Charlotte or San Antonio, like one of these they're going to eventually lose and or thinking they have a chance of losing. And they're not because it this isn't just an ant team, right? Like it's yeah. not, he's not the, well, the, the identity of the team or what they're best at is, is defense. And while ant has for sure contributed to that this year, um, when you say they have that like business approach or go and get it done, it's because they're going and getting it done consistently on defense. And Rudy Gobert is what is behind that. He was behind that tonight. Uh, I think it's six blocks again, but a bunch of the never minds and wh whatever. Just oh uh, yeah, that what was interesting. What but uh, <laughs> listen, I just want official statement. If Michael Grady told me to jump in a lake in the middle of December. I would probably yell out one of his catchphrases and then just belly flop in. So it is not it is not up for debate. It does not matter who coined Neverminds, just hearing it on the on the broadcast. Also, Neverminds, I know there's a lot of other cool ways to describe it, but it does describe what you see now on a nightly basis. And it does, all no, jokes good. aside, it does paint a picture of Rudy Gobert's dominance. I saw national accounts, like NBA University is one of my favorite Twitter follows. They were tweeting out like, it's it this is crazy. Like these professional athletes, these stars, these superstars, they have no interest in going at Rudy Gobert. So listen, man, whatever Grady says, 
he is the best in the business, so let's just give it to him. But the never minds are a fun thing to start tracking because it's a silly phrase, but it's a real thing. It's, mm-hmm. it's this fear that if I break down my defender on the perimeter, that's not it. <laughs> like That's just half the battle. That might even be a third of the battle, but two-thirds of the battle is trying to score on this seven-foot-three French guy who is far and away the leader for defensive player of the year and should have that fourth trophy here if he can stay healthy. But uh, I don't think you can over like 16 points, 20 rebounds. I think that's back to back 20 rebound games, six blocks, a steal, only two turnovers, only four fouls, perfect from the free throw line, six of nine from the field. He's not like doing the last year, Rudy Hakeem Olajuwon call for the ball stuff. He's just getting his when his is available on offense and defense, man, I don't know. It's like the same stuff I remember watching Ant early when it's like, I haven't really seen the Wolves have a player like this. I haven't seen the Wolves have a player like Rudy Gobert since Kevin Garnett, right? I mean, Kevin Garnett was really good defensively too. This Rudy Gobert stuff is incredible. And not only he is he leading the pack for, for Depoy, he's this team's MVP Depoy. right now through 21 games. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, finding the offense when it's there. Uh, did you notice that on the very first possession where Jaron Jackson Jr. was it like almost yeah. seemed mm-hmm. personal how much he was not guarding Rudy Gobert, which was his matchup. And, you know, there's a, a season ago, right? Like, yeah, it, that was kind of a legitimate strategy, like dare the Wolves to play offense through Rudy. And Rudy took six shots in the first four minutes of the game because he wasn't being guarded and. He took a jump shot from 50 feet. <laughs> hit a mid-range jumper. Yeah. Like, but just to be able to be like, no, you you can't do that to us, right? Mm-hmm. Like the I, I think there's there's a lot of power in that. I also like that it was six shots in the first four minutes. What do you say? It took nine the whole game. Yep. Like it doesn't need to be something you go at over and over and over again. You just gotta go at it enough until they start respecting you, you have to keep again them defensively. Yeah. yeah, just keep them honest and uh, you saw it. It was personal in the beginning. I'm glad you kind of shouted that out, but uh, you can't, I don't know. It just made me think of one of the coolest, I texted you this today, one of the coolest bits or segments you've done on this podcast, which is the best, by the way, best team-specific NBA podcast in the land, but was yesterday when you talked to Britt about that scout story and just the perception of all of this and how it's working this year through 21 games compared to whatever people think historically I, this is not the Rudy Gobert that I watched last year, and I don't think it's the Rudy Gobert I ever saw in a lot of primetime games when he was with the Jazz. He's a real threat, and they find ways to move him around the perimeter. He's not just standing under the basket on offense, and it made me want to fight that scout. <laughs> well, it, it's just, it, and, and they were kind of talking about it in the broadcast today too, um, and you have the national TV game against mm-hmm. the Spurs, and I think what happened or 21 games in now, and obviously the Wolves have the best record in the league. Um, I don't think that's been followed, you know, for yeah. the, a lot of the first quarter of the season, but I do think it will come around. Like it, at some point it's going to be it, uh, uh, much like Utah, right? Where you were like, okay, we, we do need to acknowledge this team. We do need to talk about this team. They have the best record in basketball. They're going to probably be the number one seed in the West. Like that's going to come. And I think, with that is going to come a greater appreciation of what we're all seeing night tonight. And really it is night tonight from Rudy Gobert in what he gives this team, at least defensively. And then more and more consistently, what he's able to do is just be uh, another valve to kind of open up offensively too. I, I just obviously, yeah, can't, can't say enough uh, good about him and he needed to be this good. I think, for this team to win every one of these games that Ant has been out for um, or, you know, the San Antonio game where Ant was kind of only uh, a fraction of himself. It's kind of, it's kind of funny going back to Neverminds as silly as that is, but it, it's <laughs> Neverminds is like a, a passcode now into like in a prestigious club. Cause if you know what Neverminds are, it's cause you're watching Rudy Gobert play this season. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, now literally like Grady and Jim are, are using it in games, but it's that level of, you can still look at a Rudy Gobert box score, and obviously the last two games he's had 40 combined rebounds, but he'll still give you a lot of, you know, 12 and 10 and two blocks, and you'll probably just think like, okay, well, look at this box score. Walker Kessler had 10 and 8, 
And it's like, yeah, but buddy, watch the like they're not doing the same things. True. They are not playing the same level of defense and they're not having the same level of impact. So the 20 rebounds are great anytime the Minnesota Timberwolves play the Memphis Grizzlies. You want to try to get as many rebounds as possible because that will haunt me till the day I die. But they also needed those 16 points, right? Mm -hmm. Like when he gets the ball really deep underneath the basket and teams just kind of go to, we just got to wrap our arms around him and follow him. Yeah, he only shot four free throws tonight, but those are four big free throws because hitting two pairs at the line kind of eliminate the potential for teams to go hack a Rudy and kind of stall out a game or break, break kind of the momentum that the Wolves had going. So just, I don't know what else you can say about him other than he, through 21 games, is the most valuable player that this team has. When he subs out, you and Britt talked about this, it's a, it's a different level of intensity on both sides. And when he's in there, man, I don't know, he hit a, he hit a 15-footer and he almost went, I, he hasn't completed the behind-the-back move yet, he's still in <laughs> process. I know Nikhil showed him, like, hey man, just kind of Euro step, like lift the ball up, and you saw Rudy kind of do that with his hands. But he is so... His, his personality and his confidence, whatever, health, trust, whatever, we'll go back and forth until we die. But he just looks so happy out there. And when he's happy, it does resonate through all his teammates. Absolutely. Um, I think another major thing to me that, and again, we're, we're, we're seeing a bunch of comments coming through here. Yeah. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to get to questions and go to that first. I just have a few things or a few things first that just I have from my notes that I want to touch on just a kind of surface level from this game. I would talk about Rudy taking those six shots at, in the beginning of the first quarter. I thought a really big turning point um, and what fueled the third quarter, like knockout punch in this game was Troy Brown, who um, starts the second half for Anthony Edwards, who's obviously uh, ruled out for that game. Troy had 11 points in the first four minutes of, of the third quarter. And for him to be my, my appreciation, or I guess just understanding of, who he is and what he can be is growing and, and growing. It's a very different player than Nikhil, I think, but kind of similar to that where there was a little bit of good from Nikhil right away at the beginning when he came and you're like, okay, like, is this a spurt? Are these tangible things that he can sustain? And I think we're getting to that point with Troy Brown Jr. where we kind of know that the scrappy stuff is going to be there night to night. We know there's, we know there's a, a jumper there. We know he can corner crash. We know he can get to the basket a little bit, handle some too. Uh, I just think on an overall really good night for the bench, Troy Brown Jr. Uh, sticks out, obviously, along with uh, Nas Reed as well. And and Shake Milton, he had some questionable like decision-making stuff at the end of the first quarter and third quarter I had written down. But overall, you're pleased with that from Shake um, to, to make a couple buckets, to look like he also uh, broke out of the confidence slump uh, that he was in as well. And when you have an injured team, man, like you, you need these bench guys uh, to, to contribute. And I, I wrote that down too. I'm like, this is, the Wolves are 17 and four, but this hasn't been like a good injury luck season at all. Like Jaden's missed the majority of the games over half of them. I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and Ant has basically missed four now. And uh, along with like Jordan McLaughlin, who, you know, that's not high in your pecking order, but that's your only other true point guard on the roster other than Mike Conley. Like, this isn't uh, the Sacramento Kings of last year where it's like everyone was just healthy the yeah. the entire time of the season. I, it's never like a good thing to rip on that. Like, that's what you want. But uh, the Wolves are not getting no, nothing. I guess it's just another way to say that this doesn't feel like a luck-infused sort of thing. I know, and I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because I think there's a tendency, and not necessarily – cynics or just just people that are like well you know yeah they won but that team didn't have so and so and it's kind of like dude they haven't had Jaden since yeah like november 10th or whatever and they really yes ant put on a timberwolves jersey against the spurs and hit a couple big shots but that wasn't him uh again kind of to the top i was texting a doctor friend and hip pointers just sound like really bad bruises i'm not a doctor but i think he's gonna be fine i also wonder just kind of spitballing back and forth here with you because you start to hear, like, why is he out there? You know, and it's like, I, I think it's more nuanced than just, I think there's conversations that are had and the medical team and the coaching staff. And there you got to remember, like, Ant's personality and yep. communication. I mean, like, a lot yep. of it is, you know, when they are these type of decisions that are, how are you feeling? It's about the, can you play? He, like, it, it's not an injury you're going to have cost lasting damage from. Are you good enough to play? 
he's clearly green lighting that. Um, so I don't know, maybe there needs to be more discourse there to, or maybe not give Ant the benefit of the doubt be like, okay, we're not, you're not playing this game. But I, I do think just cause I mean, for four years, we, we've kind of seen this, yeah. right? It's not, it's not new that Ant returns from an injury and doesn't complete a game when, when he comes back, this is, this is a pattern of, of behavior from him and um, you know, credit to him for trying to, trying to tough it out, but, you know, got to kind of figure out something there because, yeah, it's I, I don't know if you're what you're not doing him any favors. You might as well just rest it. Right. If he's not going to be able to to complete the game. And I, I was kind of complaining about this two weeks ago, right, when the Wolves are up, I don't know, 20 or something late in the fourth. Credit to Finchy, coach of the month. He did put the reserves in the deep bench in and they got a couple minutes there, but uh, he did kind of pull his guys. But I, I've, I've just been thinking about this out loud and in, in loud to my wife, like, because they're starting to build a culture, right? Like not only winning, but just this, hey, come to work. We're all focused on one mission. That's win a game. And that's great. And I think that's what they're doing with Ant. I think that's why Anthony Edwards is trying to tough it out. He wants to play being injured. I remember a player told me, like a very low player. The first time he let me in the locker room was like, being injured is very lonely because when everyone else goes over there, I have to go in there like the training room and you don't get to hang out with your teammates. You don't get to do all that stuff. I don't think Ant wants to be lonely. I think he wants to try to tough it out, be part of the teammates, but we got to get to maybe some point. I always reference that Suns game where maybe you just have to step out in front and be like, Mike, you're not playing tonight. We need you in April. And yeah. I know you can do it and you're competitive as hell, but we just will Troy will Troy will hold it down for 48 minutes until you can get back. Cause this is all still, I was telling you this earlier today. This is great. 17-4 is great. Three and a half up in the West is great. But Man. it's kind of like it's kind of like that first paycheck you get after you graduate college. Uh, you're not rich. You just got your first pay. Like you you don't you can't afford a condo yet. The Wolves, I don't we're getting a little too close to May and June talk and NBA finals talk. Totally think the fans should embrace this and have fun, but this is all building towards something that actually matters, and that's what's gonna determine if the Rudy Gobert trade was was worth it or not. So if Ant can't go on, I think it's Monday against the Pelicans, Troy Brown can do it, right? 20 points tonight, plus 18, four big rebounds. I know that sounds stupid, but he had like four rebounds that right. are just these Troy Brown dig out, throw my body in their rebounds. And then, yeah, Shake Milton, 17 points, as Jim said on the call, best game of the season in a Timberwolves uniform. I just got to say, the first quarter kind of meltdown he had with a turnover was dumb. That third quarter one, I don't know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you're in a two-on-one with Collins and Anthony Towns, there's eight seconds left. I'm going to throw him the lob. It didn't work out, but he was great, and they need that because they need these guys to step up and have a scoring punch off the bench when uh, when Ant's out. Kyle, we're going to have our uh, first break here. Uh, our newest local sponsor is mm. Your Home Improvement Company, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that this is a sponsor that makes sense for some of you listeners uh, to look into. If you are ready to make a home improvement change, keep it in the little wolves family we have here by checking out yhic.com or calling 844-270-7180. That number will be up on the screen here. Uh, Your Home Improvement Company is offering a free bathroom installation. If you act in the month of December, they offer free installation with no interest, no payments and nothing down till 2025. If you are considering a bathroom renovation, call for, call for a free estimation Again, that's 844-270-7180. And if you got drafty windows that you know are going to be letting in cold air this winter, your home improvement company has custom built and energy efficient windows direct from the factory that come with a lifetime warranty. And in December, YHIC is offering a buy two windows, get two windows deal for twice the windows at half the cost. Also, no interest, no payments, nothing down until 2025 if you're considering new windows or a new bathroom please do call your home improvement company and get your renovation done in as little as one day again that's 844-270-7180 or go to yhic.com your home improvement company where it's your home made better all right kyle where do you want to go next with this do you want to bring in something before we go to to questions uh live here from from the audience I just want you to have a glass of wine or something. You're a little too serious. This is just a gamer. This is this was nostalgic <laughs> for me because it reminded me of how far you've come and doing these during COVID. 
Oh, you know when it's worst. like there's no prep. It <laughs> no, it's not. It is the worst. But if you're listening to this on YouTube, we appreciate it. I know Coop's got a lot of questions, uh, and if you're on YouTube, subscribe. It means a lot to us. I think just a couple more random things I had in my phone about that game, and then we can kind of spin it wherever. Um, we talked about Troy Brown. We talked about Shake Milton, Nas Reed, ten points, nine rebounds. Just another jolt off the bench. He had that crazy dunk in transition, which was great. But if you want to try to keep it honest and be like, hey, was there anything? You know, meat on the bone as I drink. Kyle Anderson. It it hurts. It hurts to watch. I've been there before. I I got to play pickup yesterday over at Nike's campus, and I didn't hit my first three threes, and they just, they gave me the entire court, and it's a lonely feeling. You think about the injury room and being injured. (laughs) It's a lonely feeling, man, when they give you nine feet, and you're just bricking them. So it didn't matter. He does so many other things. His connection with Rudy, he might still hit, obviously, Mike Conley, but he has the best one of the best connections with Rudy on the court and the relationship and his defense, just a little plays he makes, but got to put a pin in that man. Cause if he can't keep the defense honest, come April, come may, that's going to be something that the scouts that you're having dinner with are going to pick apart. And it's, it was brutal to watch. I think it was zero for six from three. He obviously, again, oh, he hit one, points. he hit one in garbage time. Like after the whistle. Cause he was zero for six in the box score. I don't know. He did that big celebration. He was like, I hit what? I, maybe his foot was on the line or something. I don't know. <laughs> his foot might have, He was two for 11. <laughs> he hit a field. shot. <laughs> Seven points, six rebounds, five assists. Again, he finds different ways. Didn't foul. Does, finds ways to, to make plays, and he's an integral part of that bench. And he's been their pseudo backup point guard, right? Like with Jordan McLaughlin was healthy tonight. It's great Why news. Why does it say 0 for 6 on the box score? Maybe that, I don't know. Maybe that wasn't a three. Weird. You don't remember what I'm talking about where he did like remember, the, yeah, uh, yeah. the celebration. I, I don't know. No, that's the worst. That's the worst if he celebrated and his foot was on the line. Yeah. Get, this is a Bruder <laughs> film. But uh no, it's just it's a little thing, but there's a lineup. I don't out think there. it's a little thing, man. I I, okay, I don't. Go. I mean, Could. like the the thing is is you go, okay, so in th- you play him at the four, and maybe that won't be as much of an issue. And you could play him in the minutes with Kat, who can space the floor, right? But that's when I felt the spacing was the worst tonight. Um, was that one drive? Was that was kind of on Carl Bemery, like yeah. drove and like yep. ran into the back of of Kyle there, and it's because Kyle, like, it, it seems intuitive that Kyle and Carl would be this great fit, but Kyle, when he's not on the perimeter, um, kind of exists in the paint, right? Like he he's circling the nail, uh, as they say, and and for Carl, while he creates great floor spacing, I always say he takes up a ton of space too because. His driving game, like if he's pumping and going, he's not choosing necessarily if I'm going right or if I'm going left. So you kind of almost have to have the full lane uh, available for him. And that's why, you know, Kyle needs to be able to, in that lineup combination in particular, needs to be able to to space the floor. Obviously, like he he can make a lot out of it even when he doesn't have his shot. But even what he can make out of it isn't, enough it isn't mm-hmm. feeling like at least um so i don't know like we brit and i were talking yesterday about how we wasn't taking them at all so i can't come out and we're being like you need to take them just to get the defense to know you're going to take them uh but, but it's this obviously it's a double-edged sword I, I'm, I'm glad he's taking them because that's going to eventually be something uh that that he needs to do and it probably is just a, a confidence thing where you shoot until you start making some of them but um yeah i how how can we how can we not be noting that when we were having a conversation a month ago of if you could only keep one of mike conley or kyle anderson who would you choose like even though kyle anderson is still super valuable this inability to space the floor or have the defense you know, recognize him will be more costly as we come into this more difficult schedule that that's coming up for for the wolves for sure no and i i probably put two positive of a spin on that it is a big thing because i mean there there was a dude i'm sure you wrote down all your lineups i know you're keeping notes throughout the game i think there was a lineup once that was rudy Nikhil, kyle Nas, and shake milton and i was just like they just gotta hope to go like <laughs> hold hold their opponent to no points for the next 90 seconds because they're not going to get a bucket from here and when you get into the playoffs or you get into these high leverage moments like think of a playoff game if kyle bricks two threes in a row and the other team goes down and gets six points. Like those games are going to be tighter. They're probably going to be more low, low scoring rotations already tighten up. Like how long of a leash can you give Kyle who has been so great for this team? And 
one of, I think, Finch's most trusted players that when things are going wrong, let me just throw Kyle into the fire. But it's going to be interesting. That That's something as we do reference and joke about meat on the bone and we try to figure this all out. I know that Finch doesn't want to play that dreaded lineup I just said. I'm sure he's trying, you know, if he doesn't have eggs, he doesn't have bacon, he's still trying to make breakfast. He's like, man, give me some credit. Like, I'm trying to do something. Give me Ant, give me Jaden back. But yeah, it, it's it, you got to have a lot of shooters around Rudy because I think that's, and you've talked about this for three months, that when you have more spacing out there, it allows Rudy to float around on offense and do different things. And when you don't have that spacing, it was a nightmare. But they figured it out. The first three took about as long as it does to microwave a pizza. So the, he starts shooting them a little faster. I think by the third or fourth miss, he's like, I'm going to make one of these. Mm-hmm. So he got shooting practice in. But yeah, that's something to monitor. No Jordan McLaughlin tonight was other my note. I mean, I think maybe just no need for him. But I, I am curious, as we talked about offline, I'm excited to see this team try to acclimate these players back. What's it going to be like? I mean, Troy Brown Jr. is on a heater, but when Ant's back and Jaden's back, is he the ninth man? And the ninth man is a lot different than the 30 minutes he played tonight, right? Like, it's a yeah. harder to get into a rhythm. So it's not all peachy. I mean, yes, they're 17-4, and four, but there's going to be some stumbling and some rust and some weird fits early on as they try to you know the bench guys feel really confident right now and they're the bench guys for a reason so when they get their young duo back it's it's going to be a little difficult and as we can just i guess transition into this maybe trying to acclimate those pieces and add them back into the fold when your next 16 games are all against teams that are at or above 500 and 11 are on the road and the next five games are really really difficult it's going to be it's going to look a little wonky here so they got to continue to play really good defense yeah, let's uh, and Cooper. We'll we'll get to we'll start do questions here in in a few minutes. I just want to briefly talk about what that that schedule is. Yeah, for sure. Um, coming up as I get like one or two games ahead in my mind is like as far as I often go. But then I was looking at it today. I'm like, okay, like Monday at Pelicans, then at Dallas, back home uh, against the Pacers, then at Miami, at Philadelphia. Yeah, it's gonna be. It's certainly gonna be a departure from the level of competition that this is, I mean, you've been playing three or four of the worst teams in the league these last three or four games. Uh, but yeah, the, the meat on the bone will be a requirement to, yep. to, to win those games. I mean, how did they go? What, like, what's the number in those five games where you're like, okay, that's expectation or what I'm cool with three and two. Like, yeah. And I'm not trying to like dumb it down. This is, I, I said at the top, this is the best, this is the best moment of my life. Um, I can't believe this is my life, but they're going to run into just some sort of stagnant. Yeah. Cause even tonight again, I think at the, when I'm curious to see it when like, it, and how I, they can respond to it. it. You and I always talk a little bit on the phone, like just getting punched in the face. That's kind of how I can reference it or compare it as, I just want to see them get put in a spot. The last time it really happened was that Kings game. And you and Britt did a really good job of kind of breaking down that Kings game. But the Kings really punched him in the mouth and put Rudy in spots that very few teams this year have done. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, I mean, yeah, it was an in-season tournament game or whatever, but they didn't really respond or they weren't able to grab hold of the rope again. So I'm excited to see what happens when, you know, this is this is new territory for not only fans, but like the team. When the Minnesota Timberwolves come to town now, 11 of their next 16 are on the road, teams are going to scout them harder. This is the team that they're going to circle. They're the best in the West. Like, Teams aren't going to care about the just tragic history of this franchise. They're going to be like, this is the best team. Let's see what we're made of. Let's see. Let's, this will be a test for us in December. And they're going to throw some things at them, and it's going to be on the coaching staff and the players to kind of figure it out. But, yeah, I mean, I think over the next 16, if they can just go like 8-8 eight and because eight, it's so brutal. But over the next five, yeah, if you, every five-game chunks, right, if you can just go 3-2 and two the rest of the year, you're going to probably win 54 games at the pace they're on. So 3-2 and two would be great, but... I almost just want to see them play better basketball at halftime tonight when they did four factors. I think the Grizzlies are shooting like 54% and the Wolves are shooting 40%. Again, they're masking really poor def- offensive performances with great defensive performances. They're going to need offense. You said I noticed that too. Like the, the, the Grizzlies finished 15 of 35 from three. So it's 43%, but they were like close to, or at 50% from three for yep. most of this game. I looked that up in the middle. I'm like, Wow, I don't remember like looking up opponent three point field goal percentage and seeing like forty eight percent, and then seeing <laughs> right. them down by nineteen. You know, like right. Uh, so obviously that's a confluence of factors uh, from from the Wolves there to be able to, you know, be able to take some of that. I think a lot of it was they rebounded really well in in this game. Like they was just they went to that two three zone a lot. They went to the three bigs a little bit. Like that zone is becoming a staple 
of the number one defense's defensive identity and what can be a problem when you're playing zone is is rebounding that was a big problem a year ago when they went to that uh i'm i was i didn't like the zone at at the beginning of the season i thought it was like taking away some of the teeth of Mm -hmm. the defense but it uh i think it's necessary for certain lineup combinations finch started out like pretty much just doing it when it was Nas and carl on the floor together i think he's starting to like it when rudy's out there which i get it's like i mean on that back line if you got like Nas, Rudy, and Kyle Anderson. And then uh, up top, if you have two seven foot wingspans and Troy Brown Jr. and Shake Milton, like that's not a normal zone. That's that feels like a six person zone, uh, much more than it does your, your, your <laughs> typical two, three zone, just based on, on the size. When you put Carl in there too, and it was all three of the centers on the back line, I was like, there's not really holes in the back line of, of this zone here. So, um, also, also, yeah, you, you, you are such a basketball aficionado and nerd, uh, and Thank I you. focus on I focus on the lesser things. But just organically, as much as we joke about never minds, organically, just during the broadcast, I know how much you love the big lineup with Nas, Carl, and Rudy, and then that transitioning into unicorns, and then just calling that lineup a blessing, <laughs> which is a group of unicorns. Like it, this season, man, is way too fun. I, I did want to ask you though, because I was thinking about the zone, and it happens when the Wolves are in zone, but it, it does happen more so, obviously, when they're playing man. But a quick segment of, like, Ask the Expert. It seems like when I watch games, that, and I watch a lot of other games, we, you and I are watching all the in-season tournament stuff, the Wolves fight around screens, it seems like, more than other teams. Like, it's an emphasis. Like Nikhil on Bain tonight, man. And like... I'm just asking you, like, one, do you notice that? And two, it. I feel like they might lead, I don't know if this is a stat, but they lead the league in drawing fouls just sure. fighting around screens do you pick up on that as well yeah i mean I, I think like to your point of other teams i think you really notice it when you're watching and the team has one player who isn't doing that you know <laughs> and you're like yeah. that and we've had a, a handful of those here in in minnesota we had a, like four of them last year on the team um, <laughs> one of them was on the grizzlies tonight yeah <laughs> true uh but like I say that to mean I who is the one guy on this Wolves team that doesn't do that. Obviously, like Keel is super committed to it, and it, I think it pops the most mm-hmm. when he does. But you put in, I mean, Ant, I guess, is the worst at that, but he's been better at it this year than he, he has in the past. I mean, I don't know if this is like a super like glass half empty thing, but I actually mean it as a positive. I was just thinking about the rotation players and thinking about like, Okay, who's like the worst defender who plays for the Wolves? And I maybe it's Carl Anthony Towns, who we're we've been lauding for having <laughs> who had an awesome defensive season and making it work at the four. Like they're that's part of this that we just don't talk about enough is the Wolves don't really have a hole on on defense. That a player that comes in is like just a bucket getter or something like that, and you you make up for it or you you live with it on the defensive end, like. Who's that guy? And he's not been th- that. It hasn't been anybody who's been playing um, in in the rotation for this team thus far this season. So, do let's you uh, ta- do you tackle ahead. when Nikhil goes around him though? Because I know how much I oh, know yeah. how much Dane Moore loves hoops and just loves the nitty gritty. <laughs> Nikhil's like flubber, like he just kind of squeezes all around the stuff and does the weird flubber. angles. But he also seems he's maybe getting a reputation, and then I'll, I'll let us go to questions. But he has to be one of the guys that just sucks to play against. I mean, like sure. got Desmond Bain did his arms aren't long enough to reach and punch Nikhil, but Desmond Bain wanted to fight Nikhil. Like he just Nikhil's annoying. And when you put that with Jaden going around screens and the way Mike just navigates and I remember at Media Day, he's like, I try to find ways to not absorb yeah. contact. Sure. Uh it's that's a crazy front line that you can throw out there, obviously with the size. And then when your backcourt is working that hard around screens, uh it's good stuff. 127, 103, Wolves over the Grizzlies. Let's get some questions. All right, uh, let's let's do some questions. Uh, Cooper has one up here from Andrew Schoenbauer. How often do you think we see the three unicorn lineup against actual good teams over the next couple of weeks, assuming Ant and Jaden are both healthy? I, I think I, I'll, I'll, I'll take that first. Yeah, now because they played it for one minute tonight. Um, like, it's, and well, it was a blessing for that yeah, one. Minute. <laughs> it was a blessing for that one minute. Kyle Anderson. It was after Kyle missed like those those four threes, and it's like obviously like 
what is the what is the downside? Why why would it not be an upgrade in this situation to slide Nas to the three and 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 take Kyle out? What what are you even sacrificing at, at that point? And I guess the answer is defense. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're corresponding to protecting themselves there by playing that two three zone. Um, I, I want to see them go one. I want to go to see them go to that lineup more often. I just think it's three of your like six best players um, to try and play them together, you know, more often, but I want to see them just play straight up and play man, because if this is going to be something um, and a lineup that they actually play in the playoffs or in games that matter, you're going to need to be able to guard in man to be able to, you know, to make it work right now. It is being treated as what's the word. Uh, It's like a, special occasional sort of thing and a blessing I, a blessing <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it, it like do you want it to be more than that and i don't think finch is at that point yet and maybe you get it, getting Jaden back and whatever you you have different answers that you can go to at the three in a game where you don't want to play kyle at the three or whatever it doesn't need to be Nas necessarily but at some point maybe you want to get to that maybe you go we're 19th in offense we need to just inject more offense into our 48 minutes night tonight. Nas is probably a pretty good way to do that. And the only way to play him more than he currently is playing is to play him at another position because the four and five minutes are full. So I want to see it. I don't think Finch is there other than for a couple minutes here and there. And it just, I'm a big believer in if you want to develop something, you got to let it marinate yeah. for, for a little bit longer than than two minutes uh, here and there so they can get comfortable with it. Like, uh, was that the the Charlotte game, right? Where they yep. played played all three of them down the stretch there and they got popped defensively. Like, okay, you got popped. Like, what, what did you learn from it? Can we do something differently in the future to make this uh, simple? So I, I would just like to see it, one, because I think it makes sense um, in a, from a talent standpoint of getting more talent on the floor. I think it makes sense and getting more offense out there because it means more Nas. And again, at least when Jaden's out, there's not a lot of opportunity cost to it in my mind. Well, I was waiting for you to bring this up because I don't know if you tweeted this, you said this on a pod, but one of the smart things you said was <clears throat> that's, you, that's what you're doing with Kyle, right? Like with Carl and Rudy, like they have to play together. They have to play. That's the whole point of this experiment, mm-hmm. this roster and the way that this salary is structured. So to find minutes for Kyle, you just got to play him at the three. Uh, what is the real difference between like Nas and Kyle? I think it's perimeter defense. It's just like, like he, I mean, and Kyle is having a really good defensive season. Kyle Anderson facts. And like, you can't remember when DeJounte Murray was just like wrecking the wolves. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And what was the answer they eventually went to? It was like, okay, Kyle Anderson. The only time DeJounte Murray cooled off is when Kyle Anderson guarded him. That would never be your like, answer to we need to slow down this perimeter creator on the other team put Nas Reed on him you know so I think that okay. I mean I'm reach I'm but I think that's like the the only real case to be made here is is that you would miss Kyle Kyle's defense but offensively you're gonna have way better spacing um you have mm-hmm. a, obviously you have another shooter on the floor there Nas really does go kind of camp in the corner there too he's not taking up that space i think he really recognizes like all right i'm in with the two bigs rudy always does this thing when he snaps when he's like we need to think about who's on the floor together and realize Nas does a really good job of that um offensively and i don't know i don't know if it can be a good i don't know if it can be a, a good lineup combination i just know we're not going to figure that out unless it's like earnestly tried uh, we have another question here from Damon Green, Dane Kyle of the show Lads. Have you noticed a change in Cat's demeanor this year? It feels like his complaining is down a bunch from last year. Do you contribute this to Conley slash winning or maturity? You want to take that first? No, I'm I'm I just finished off that glass of wine. I just want to throw all these questions back to you because you're there. I mean, you're there. You're in the locker. Yeah, room. I mean, my, my you know answer mean? is that this this changed in Golden State. Like obviously game one I was, or game two. Game after game one, Carl played. Carl played really well. Really well. Okay, so before um, the choke. And I, I'm just going off of the demeanor of Carl that I see, right? And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm seeing the, the the same things a lot of other people were noticing in training camp at the beginning of the season, the way Carl was answering questions, just the 
the vibe he had. And, you know, I was like, okay, like, let's, I'm not gonna freak out about it, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like we, we can't say, Oh, don't say these things when you go on podcasts and, and simultaneously be upset with him for being Are you talking quiet. To I'm me? Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> oh, no, Carl. Okay. <laughs> to yeah, everyone. Right to yes. Um, and, and then I'm like, it, it got to be a week or two into the season and I like, I'm like, okay, Carl's still doing this. You know, he's he's still being quiet. He's still being somewhat somber. And then in Golden State, it switched. And it went back to being the Carl personality that I've covered for five, six years, whatever, since, since, since I've been around him. And so I don't know if he just needed some time there or whatever it was, but I think the old Carl in terms of his persona and his confidence – and the adventure that is Carl, like it is, <laughs> it is all back. Like, um, and again, remains as, as I say, like the ceiling of this team, you know, lies in Carl's ability to, to get them there, which is kind of crazy when we're just kind of thinking of who have been the most impactful players on this team thus far this season. He might be fourth, he might be the fourth most impactful player uh, on the team thus far this season, yet simultaneously, holds this ability to let you think about the ceiling of this team, a potential Western conference finals team winning, winning playoff series and that sort of thing. It's a, it's a good place. If I, if you had to choose one place that you're like, we're still figuring it out or we're allowing it to get better. Like Carl's a, Carl's a pretty good place for that to be. And I think mentally he's back to what he was. Well, and as you said, this is maybe mid-November, but Rudy Gobert and the defense right now is the floor. And you're seeing the floor night in, night out. Mm -hmm. This team's not playing super well offensively. They got a lot of... It's the floor because, sorry to cut you off, but because, J like, Jaden's not even out there. Right. That's yep. good, right? Like, yep. that's why it's the floor, and it's really damn good. But, and, and there were moments where it was really tough, right, Carl? Straight voltage, saying weird things, doing weird things, lots of turnovers. But the ceiling of this franchise and this team and this year is belongs to Carl Anthony Towns. I mean, just to do 42 minutes live here and not bring up the fact that he was 24, 7, and 5, one turnover, 50% from the field, 50% from three, eight from nine from the free throw line. And also, just to more the demeanor, the real original question, I'm sure you picked this up during the, the Spurs game the other night against Wemby or even tonight against Jaron Jackson. He was taking the defensive matchups kind of personal as well mm -hmm. and was getting really physical with Wimby, with Jaron Jackson Jr. But then it, it stayed in that moment. It didn't like percolate moving forward or he didn't start mm -hmm. to like once the play was over, it wasn't looking around trying to get more attention. It was just, okay, head down, sprint back on offense. Uh, and that for as much as you and I hopped on a pod in early November and criticized it a month later, his demeanor, this whole team's demeanor, it really is... I know it's the same thing I said a hundred times, but it's it's a business like mentality, and I love that man. I love mm -hmm. that. Like I, I know it's well, it's just fun to like go into games and like having that expectation, which has you come into this Memphis game. Like, yeah, they're gonna win. Like I'm doing my notes, prepping for this this morning, and I'm writing my intro, and I'm like, after the Wolves beat the Grizzlies in Memphis <laughs> on Whoa, Friday night, yeah. you know, like I, yeah, well, yeah. it's. I mean, obviously, I think it's a hundred percent chance that they when But what a departure from a year ago, right? Where you'd be like, I don't know. Let's see which Wolves team shows up tonight, and if they show up for the for the full forty eight minutes, and man, has that changed, right? And, and, and the third quarter stuff. I mean, it's just it's just a it's such a massive departure from what this team was a year ago. And and I've preached how much more enjoyable it is for me to watch really good defense compared to maybe really good offense. But it's I don't know I have a long dating record here, kind of been with Abby for a while. But it's got to be like just dating immature people after immature people, and you finally find someone who's really mature and likes wine and goes to bed at nine on Fridays. Watching this team just not do dumb things and not get technical fouls and not blow up and give up you know ten, twelve, fourteen zero runs, that too comes across the screen as a viewer. It's just like man, this is that's why I think this is such a likable team. It's not just the personalities and the funny quotes after wins it's the way they handle themselves during i mean they haven't had a ton of tough moments but during a little bit of adversity you lose ant no points four minutes again the hip thing he calls out he doesn't come back next man up that's that's maturity that's 
That's mm-hmm. dating someone who goes to bed at nine, and uh, it's great. Uh, next question from Doogie Hauser, uh Related, what do you think has turned the Wolves into an elite third quarter team this year? I actually want you to answer this one first. Elston Turner, yelling at people at halftime. Okay. No, I mean, I, I I should answer some of these. I'm your guest on this thing, but uh, you're there. You're you're in the you're in the building. You talk to these guys in the locker room. It does sound. Well, I, I I know what I know what my answer is. I I I, I well, I'm just hot taken here, but I I think they go into the third quarter and it. It's a lot of the stuff that you can't find on Basketball Reference. It's the chemistry. It's I would imagine, and this is what I always harp on, I know they do track the pack. It's a 20-minute video. These guys are together 24-7, and there's so much dialogue and conversation and interactions that we never see. And I think those things are – I think this team likes each other. I think they trust each other. I think they really enjoy mm-hmm. each other as colleagues and teammates and professionals. And in third quarter, if, you know, if they – messed around in the last 30 seconds of the second and gave up a couple turnovers and gave up a couple buckets, I bet you they all get in their seats and they're like, hey, stop doing that. We're trying to win this game. And they can hold themselves a little more accountable. The locker room seems far less toxic than it was last year. I was in that locker room at times. I, that's my thing. I, I think the team, the players, the 15 guys on that roster, feel that if something happened in the first half, they can go sit down in those comfy leather chairs and bring it up during halftime. And then I also think, too, because they've said it multiple times, guys like Elston Turner, the coaches come in and there's a relationship and a trust that they can hold these guys accountable. That ties into maturity. That ties into continuity as well. So that's my take, and I hope you agree with it. Yeah. No, I mean, mine is the same thought. It's just more specific, and it's Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert. I think Ooh, that the, okay. the combination of them and the the maturity or the amount of time that they've been in the league to understand – the importance of the start of the third quarter. I mean, not to like rip on Ant, but I think early in his career, he didn't like recognize that, right? Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. came out and it was the first couple minutes of the third quarter and he looked like Andrew Wiggins, you know, just kind of like the more lethargic approach, like needed something to get him going. And I think about that Thunder game before he got hurt and he got going right away, like to start that third quarter. I think he had like a, the first. 11 points or whatever it was. Um, and, and I think something has turned that light on in his head. And I think the someone is Mike Conley um, and somewhat related uh, Rudy Gobert there too, because yeah, that's just becoming an expectation, right? Like I kind of thought that it was a close game at halftime, a little bit like annoyingly close mm-hmm. given how it was just, they were so clearly the superior team tonight. And you're like, okay, well this better be like, Better take this from a three-point lead to like twelve before you know the six-minute mark of the third, and they did, and they do. Like that is a a very consistent thing. And and I know I joked about dating people that go to bed at nine on Fridays, but this well, team you live you live on the West Coast, so that's well, I know. So I have the best sports schedule in the world. But this this team also does have, as we do our flagrant howls leadership power rankings, the leadership still comes a lot from what you said, Mike Conley in his late thirties. Rudy Gobert, 30s, Kyle Anderson, 30s. A lot of 9 p.m. Uh, bedtimes there. But to, to, to back to your point, like they were up 60 55 at, at half. Then they outscored them 38 to 24. When you get older, you know, like, let me get my stuff done early so I can get, like, and they, that, they're a third quarter <laughs> team now. Like, how often do you watch yeah. this team historically come out and just blow big leads in the third quarter? These vets know, like, let's cook this thing in the third mm-hmm. so that we can have the Luca Garza, like, bat signal early in the fourth. Also, too, just now that I'm looking at the box score, when's the last time you remember the Wolves winning all four quarters of a basketball game? Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that might be a first this year, too. So, yeah, I think, I think they come into those half times, and you hear this all the time in the league, just guys coming in, getting some water, getting a banana, and looking at their phones. I'd imagine sure. there's not a lot of phone usage. I imagine it's like, mm-hmm. hey, we're going to make real adjustments. We're going to give each other a little pep talk, and the vets are going to say, like, hey, th- we, we, again, we've – just like we've done nothing on the season, we've done nothing by being up five through 24 minutes. Let's mm-hmm. go out there, come out early, stomp them, and then just we can then we can cruise and we can celebrate and do a bunch of stuff, fun stuff in the fourth. That happened tonight. It's happened countless times over the season, and it just it's it's cool. It's cool. I love maturity. I love grown ups playing basketball. Uh, it's been really fun to watch. Let's do this. Uh, you, you hinted at the Rudy Gobert. Like, where does he 
fall in his value to this team relative to the rest of the league? Is he in that most valuable player conversation? The question here from Snide is, does Rudy seem to be playing at MVP levels? His impact is just so noticeable. I mean, that's a high bar, right? Like, there's a there's a handful of guys uh, around the league who are doing that. You look at some of the impact metrics that I think do end up really at least framing the conversation, like to kind of start it of like, all right, who are our eight most impactful guys? And then from there, we're going to get to our ballot guys, right? There's five guys who are voted for on the ballot. And I think the I think the hope is that Rudy can approach that conversation, the back end of the ballot. But that is just such a, a high bar. If you look, uh, if, if you just look at like estimated plus minus, which is, I think the, probably the, the best thing to look at here, like the most impactful players thus far here, I'll zoom in on it. Jokic, LeBron, Shea, Embiid, Giannis, Anthony Davis, you got Hal Burton in the mix there. Luca's a little bit lower. Kevin Durant, Jason Tatum, like, Rudy is still a ways down on this. Now, these aren't perfect metrics. There's been a lot of weird on-off stuff that uh, impacts a lot of this stuff, like D'Angelo Russell is currently ahead of uh, Rudy Gobert on here uh, no, 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 as well. No, go back up. Go back up. Did I missed it. Yeah. This this stat was really smart, and you brought this to my attention. Oh, earlier. yeah. Here we go. Yeah, 90th but percentile for You for lost Gobert me right when now. Yusuf Nurkic is two spots ahead of Rudy Gobert. But but it's a really good stat. I know what you're trying to say. It's like well, it's generally like let's yep. look at the top ones: Jokic, LeBron, Shea, Embiid, Giannis. Like yep, heard of the, them. You know they're, they're going to be in in that conversation. And I just bring this up to mean like what they, Jim and Grady talked about it a lot on the podcast. Like the being in the conversation. Um, I think you know you sustain this, and he absolutely could be in the conversation. Um, it's just let's remember that these are the names that that he's going mm-hmm. up against. Uh, even making all NBA right now in a positionless all NBA, meaning you're a top 15 player, that might even be somewhat difficult uh, for, for him to do. But I think he's definitely put himself in that conversation, just like Ant has um, as well as, and I mean, that that's pretty legit having two top 15 players in the league or in that conversation. Just being in the conversation is Mm -hmm. something that like you can, I guess, record or print out and put it on. I know Rudy has that trophy case still in Utah, that is the the award for himself. Someone said in the chat that he doesn't score enough points to win MVP, and a lot of those MVP metrics metrics I say tongue in cheek are still pretty simple. It's going to come down to who scores a bunch of points and who's on a winning team, and that's mm-hmm. not going to be Rudy Gobert. But that doesn't mean that he's not the MVP of this team. Sure. Um, but yeah, just being in the conversation, right? Being that's that's a pretty crazy 180 from where he was 12 months ago when people are like he's cooked, mm-hmm. and now it's like just to think that. He's not even going to get a vote, right? I mean, I was just looking on DraftKings, which is kind of like the stats you showed, but different. There's 41 <laughs> guys listed for MVP odds right now. He's not one of them. Wow. Carl and Ant are listed above him. Like, he has no chance, zero chance to win MVP, but that's fine because it's all about mm-hmm. what he does defensively. Let your offensive playmakers, let the you know the best shooting big men of all time, let this f- potential face of the league in Anthony Edwards do their thing. Rudy just needs to hold it down on defense and – if you go look at the defensive player of the year odds, like Rudy is far and away right now leading that category. And if he wins who's second, that, who's second in that? Ah, oh, do you want to? Well, I'll take another question. You looked that up. I'm just curious. I, I haven't looked at any of that stuff. Cooper, you got another question? It was here Jaron for us? Jackson Jr. this morning. It's not okay. posted now, but it was Jaron Jackson Jr. Which, by the way, get out of here. <laughs> well, it's and the the interesting what I always say between Jaron Jackson Jr. and Rudy Gobert, and what I said last year when Jaron Jackson Jr. won it, and he had a he did have a great defensive season, but the most underrated part of Rudy's defense is how rarely he fouls. Yep. And, and Jerry Jackson Jr. is in the same tier of fouling as Carl Anthony Towns and Jade McDaniels, maybe even above that in frequency. And to be a rim protector and to have as low of a foul rate as Rudy does, and that that's intuitive, right? Like, are you blocking the shots? Are you getting never minds at the rim? Or are you putting them at the line for two? You know, like, mm-hmm. I mean, that that is one of the, I think, most underrated parts of Rudy. And it's really stood out to me is you know, how often in comparison to Jaden and like how often Jaden and Carl get in foul trouble versus Rudy. I'm like, man, Rudy's in a hell of a lot more actions and foul situations, certainly than Carl is. I mean, I know Jaden gets a lot of his on bumps on the perimeter and that sort of thing. But how many shots is Rudy contesting or getting players to not even take per game 25 
you know, and to leave it. How many fouls did he have tonight? Four. Couple. Yeah, they were like, weird ones. They were I mean, and he's not that that's higher than than he he normally is, you know, and so gonna, and it's almost always one now on a screen that kind yeah. of the other team does the same. Try to fight around it, flop around. It's you normally the, like a possession after he's gotten hit in the face and then he's angry. And he he did fouled, lose his he, mind tonight when there was a night, weird ro- yeah. when uh, tonight it was a little more aggressive when there was like a weird rotation. And Bismack Campbell like got the ball, and arm. Bismack kind of dunked on him. And I, one thing I do love about Rudy Gobert is he's so not afraid of the internet. Like, he's not afraid of being memed. He wasn't afraid of the chokehold by Draymond Green. He's going to contest shots and probably get dunked on. Yeah. But he was really mad about that rotation. You opened up this can of worms. I get to throw this in here quick. MVP, uh, Defensive Player of the Year, all that stuff. As of today, just today, 12-8-2023. There is no argument whatsoever, none, for anyone else to be coach of the year than Chris Finch. None. I don't care that I have a ticket at 22 to 1, and now he's plus 450. If you thought this team had to blow it up in the summer, and you thought the Rudy Gobert experiment with Carlton Towns was so bad, and the trade was the worst ever, for Finch to, I mean, it was an experiment. We said experiment as much last year as we say meat on the bone this year. This team did nothing to change the ingredients of the, the experiment. They just changed the recipe. They just tweaked yep. some of the numbers. It's all the same guys. It's the run it back to her. And for Chris Finch to have these guys at 17 and four, multiple games up in the West a week into December, get out of here with yeah. Dagnalt or Jamal Mosley or anyone. <laughs> email, like, get out of here. It is Chris Finch with a bullet. That man has turned around the same team that everyone made fun of. And now he is cruising in the Western Conference. End of rant. Answer well, no, question. just and the, the the difficulty of the job, to or the yeah, complications yeah. of the job. I think the behind that the scenes can and, and should be you know considered when that gets there. And and you know not that Dagnalt doesn't have his own set of things to navigate with that roster construction or the youth in Orlando. Credit to Mosley there, but I mean. We know how difficult of a puzzle it is to coach this team because we watched last season, mm-hmm. you know, and and that should count. <laughs> and, and those other two teams don't have expectations. True. The Magic and Thunder could go 41 and 41. Everyone's like, that's cute. They have a lot mm-hmm. of picks and they're fun. Right. The Wolves can't <laughs> do that. The Wolves have to win mm-hmm. 50 games and a playoff series in the eyes of some, most notably outside of the market. They're like, if they don't do that, you got to fire the coach. It's like, dude, this guy has turned the exact same roster with a little Troy Brown mixed in and Shake Milton every once a month and has this team playing some of the best basketball we've ever seen. But, okay, rant over. Yeah, meat on the bone. He's convinced his team that everybody's food. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we have another question here. This from is a good one. This is a good J.D. One. Robert Lorio. Uh, how do you see the rotation going once everyone is healthy? How would J-Mac shake TBJ minutes shares how would what would the what would what's the rotation going to look like once this team is he- healthy? Have you uh, have you thought about this a lot? Yeah, dudes are going to catch DNPs. Yeah, because Finch isn't going to go ten deep, right? It's like the same thing. Like I would love for Leonard Miller to just drop from the Raptors like Sting every once in a while, but he's not going to play the young guys. And when they're fully healthy and they roll out Mike Conley, Anthony Edwards, Jaden McDaniels, Conley Towns, and Rudy Gobert, and you got to find minutes for Nas Reed, and you trust Kyle Anderson. That's seven, and then I think Troy Brown Jr. has earned his keep, so he's in it. So tonight, Jordan McLaughlin busted his ass to get back from that injury, was available tonight, didn't play. Mm-hmm. That's going to be normal. Uh, I think Shake Milton, again, had a career night in terms of being a Timberwolves player. He might just catch DMPs every night if Ant's really cooking and doesn't have a lot of foul trouble. So, I mean, I just listed Nas, Kyle, and TBJ on the bench. That's eight. I think Finch will be okay playing eight man rotations in games that he really wants to win. Maybe you mix in a little shake, maybe you mix in a little Jordan McLaughlin, but mm-hmm. with all three of those guys at full peak health, those some of those guys are just not going to play. Yeah, there's going to be. Well, so we went into the season right where it was Troy Brown Jr. and Jordan McLaughlin were out of the rotation, and mm-hmm. so it's going to there's there are two spots of these top eleven guys that don't get to play, and it's going to be somebody who's hurt. Um, or it's going to be two people who you didn't plan on giving DMPs to that are that are taking them, and yeah, I think it's shaking Jordan McLaughlin right now. And I, I my my personal hope 
is that they don't go 10 just to keep a 10th person happy. What, whoever, right, or yeah. however that, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just don't think given how much I think you want to play your bench players. I mean, I don't think you're going to want to, if it's going to go to 10, then like you're never playing Nikhil over 20 minutes a game. I want to play Nikhil 20 minutes. A oh, game. I didn't even mention Nikhil. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And that's, that's crazy. Yeah. So it, it's, I, I think it is more of a, given how much you want to play, Kyle Anderson, Nas Reed, and Nikhil Alexander Walker, how I understand Finch does, it is kind of wow, a yeah. team that's more like eight and a half rotation, I think is the right number. And so maybe that's picking a ninth guy night to night and that kind of shakes through, but maybe it needs to be sometimes no shake, no J Mac, and no Troy Brown Jr. Troy Brown Jr. too. Like if if it's if you want to play, if you want to play Nas a lot, like there are still just 48 minutes available here. And this is what good teams deal with. Like I was watching the Pelicans a little bit this week and I've, I've actually caught a lot of them this season. And I, Jordan Hawkins has been like one of my He's favorite yep. rookies. I've, I've watched this season. He's out of rotation now in new Orleans because they got healthy, you know? And I was like, I just like was watching a Pelicans game and start doing like the list thing in my phone of like, Oh, it's like, who would be on all rookie team. It's like, Oh, Jordan Hawkins. He, he's going to be on all rookie team for sure. Well, nope. He doesn't even, now he's not even in the right. rotation of his team. Like the Pelicans aren't like some great team either. Like if, if you are a great team, a good player isn't going to play and that's going to have to be um, okay. And I, I think Troy Brown jr. Rolled with it, got his opportunity. Like guys are going to continue to get hurt throughout this season. Mm -hmm. And Jaden's going to continue to get in foul trouble. Carl's going to continue to get in foul trouble. And maybe that just opens it up there. But I, I'm just, I guess I'm just curious to see what defines it. Is it, is Finch going like, this is a J Mac matchup or is it J Max out of the rotation for, for two weeks? Let's go a little bit faster here on uh, a, a couple of these. Someone <laughs> just said Matt Ryan is even further out of the rotation right yeah. now. Um, <laughs> yeah. This, let me, let me ask this one. So Nikki Anderson says, is Rudy and Mike's playing time sustainable throughout the right, throughout the regular season? Good question. Will they have enough in their tanks for the playoffs? Do you want to go first? Yeah. I mean, aren't you just a little concerned about that? Like, but I, I, I think majorly my concerned. is like, no, like, I, I don't know. Like I, 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 at least with Mike, I don't think he has an 82 game gas tank at 30 minutes a night. And I know he's expressed that he doesn't want to sit back to backs. And I think there's some logic to, you know, he isn't taking a difficult defensive matchup. He's not like guarding the opponent's number one wing creator, right? Um, he gets to hide a little bit on defense and maybe that allows him to be able to play more or play through back-to-backs, back -back. but I think there's going to be a segment of us who, when it is a back-to-back -back and you get the notification that Conley out parentheses rest, you're going to be like, okay, cool. Like, that's that's fine because I, I don't know. I mean, how, how sustainable, how reasonable is it to expect anything else if we're just, like, operating, like, in a super logic box? And, and I think with Rudy, too. Like, I'm fine if Rudy ends the year with, like, even if he's doesn't have a catch an injury the whole year, like playing 76 games or something like that. Like that's, that's fine. These guys are in their thirties. Rudy dealt with back spasms last year. He is a year removed from having some physical ailments. Like, yeah, I don't think it's going to be 82 games of this, right? I think this is a way, I know we're an hour in and they won and they're 17 and four. I think it's the, like a question that's way bigger and way not, I'm with disgust that, man. enough yeah. is that Anthony Edwards is awesome. And he might be the face of the league at some point. And Jay McDaniels might be the best perimeter defender. And Carl Anthony Towns might be the best shooting big of all time. I don't think this team stands a chance in the playoffs if they don't have Rudy Gobert at 100%. And I don't know if this team – I think this team can maybe win a first-round playoff series if Mike's banged up, but they're not going to have a chance advancing past that if they don't have Mike. Man. I don't know if they can. I mean, I think Mike is so. I mean, I kind of like half said it earlier. Like, I, I think for my money, Mike Conley might be more impactful this year than Carl has been, and that's not a knock on Carl. That is a mm -hmm. compliment to the consistency of of Mike Conley. And and it just kind of comes back to this this gray area that I can't really comment on. And you're you're there, but I don't even know how much you can comment on it at times. Is 
these conversations that happen behind the scenes. I love the new culture. I love that we're suiting up every night, going to war, mm-hmm. earning our paychecks on stuff. But there does need to come a point where someone higher up is looking out for the long term. And again, I'm I'm sure Tim Connolly is having these conversations and Chris Finch yeah. and all these people, but. I, if Mike Conley doesn't play next week. I, I or, know they've had a conversation with Conley about this, and he does not. He has told them he does not want to rest on the back end of back-to-backs. Mike Conley, yeah. And and again, and that's what makes this all kind of fun and weird. And, you know, this, this he's not the only one. I remember when Chris Paul got traded to the Thunder, there was that big story that, like, he met with Sam Preston. He's like, I'm not yeah, here right. to not play. <laughs> And I get it. I get when you're older, you're like, I need to play in as many games as possible. This is the biggest chance I have. This this might be Mike Conley's best chance to win a ring. Uh, I love this, the Chris Paul, Mike Conley comp, actually. just to, No, I mean, just what happened in Phoenix. Or mm-hmm. It's like, I, I think a lot about Chris Paul was such a big part of that Thunder team that maybe that's, and he I think he was like 34 when he was on the Thunder. And then the first year when he was with the Suns, he was 35. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm making that connection in my head in terms of obviously it's the unique style of, of point guard, but the, the impact and the difference and the, the games, when you look at it, like Mike Conley shoots three of 14 and you see a plus 26 next to his name. I mean, that's Chris Paul stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That's peak Chris Paul stuff or Chris Paul a few years ago. Like, um, Mike Conley is it was just great when Finch was like, I don't know why you guys keep asking me <laughs> how important Mike Conley is. He's pretty goddamn important, you know, and it just it just is. And it mostly because like I'm not saying Nas can do everything Carl can do, but like Nas can do some of what Carl can do. Who on this team can do anything that Mike Conley can do? But it but okay, let me just take this a step further and then we can close it out. It's not just about <clears throat> resting Mike and Rudy and obviously probably wouldn't do it on the same night or whatever. But to me, the way you would sell it to those guys when you have a one-on-one and you talk to them is that I also want to try to like, if Rudy does pick up his third foul in the first, in game six of the first round in the the two minutes into the second quarter, how do we defend for the next 10 minutes without Rudy? I want to see other guys like Troy Brown jr. We're only talking about him. He was only unearthed from the bench because guys were not playing now due to injury, but you want to start to be like, we need to find a backup point guard for April, possibly May, and God forbid, June. Mike, we just need you to take one off for the night. Like, right. wear your best outfit. We got to see if Jordan McLaughlin can hold it down a little bit. We got to see if Ant can make a couple more plays. It's not just the preservation of these dudes that are going to be really important come April and May. It's also, can the guys behind them fill that void so that when you... You do lose Mike to a tough screen against Draymond Green in Game Two in April. That you know the team knows the chemistry, the vibes, the trust. Jordan McLaughlin's going to come in and figure this out, mm-hmm. and we've seen it before. We saw it in February, yeah. we saw it in March. So I, I know it's weird. Seventeen four champagne, champagne problems, but the way that they're going to manage these guys, we are still. I think tonight was like the the quarter mark, twenty five percent. There's still 50%, right? And there's still 75%. And it's getting <laughs> colder, and there's going to be snow in a lot of these cities. I would really love it, not only because it preserves them and keeps their tank full for when it matters, but just give guys – it's not going to be Leonard Miller. I know I joke, but can Jordan McLaughlin hold it down? Can Shake Milton against the Celtics in a game in January be a good enough point guard to keep the boat afloat? Uh, I think it's a, something that we're going to keep talking about for the next 60 games. Kyle, let's do our prize picks segment. Today's show is brought to you all by prize picks, prizepicks.com, prize picks app, promo code Dane for $100 sign up bonus. I already put mine up here, Kyle. You know, I love these (laughs) touchdown ones. Yep. I know you do. And which is kind of stupid because touchdowns are a little random. I get that. But can you help me choose two of these? I I picked all five of these players. So I'm like, I don't think it's a 50% chance that Zach Moss scores a touchdown, that Austin Eckler scores a touchdown, that Tony Pollard scores a touchdown, that Devon A-Chain A-Chain scores a touchdown, that Saquon Barkley scores a touchdown. Like, I might just take that one right there. 10 to 1, that none of those five players score a touchdown this week. If four are right, you get two times your money. You get half half your money if three of them are, are right. I like that one. But help me pick quickly. Help me pick. What are your, of these five, who are the two least likely 
to score a touchdown this week. Least likely, <clears throat> Austin yep. Eckler. Yep. Just because there's some weird stuff going on there, and they might have the worst coach in the league. And then I'd probably say Zach, Zach Moss or Barkley. So I'll go Barkley just because that game script could be weird. Yep. HN's going to score. They're like a 13 and a half point favorite against Tennessee on Monday night. They're running the ball everywhere. And I think Pollard in the game of the week, right? Cowboys, Eagles. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like him to score as well. So did I hit that right? Do you agree? Sure. Yeah. I was just like looking at him like, I don't know. There, there's no way any of those five guys, it's a 50% proposition that they're going to score. I think all of those are value on, on not scoring a passing or rushing touchdown. Obviously, so how prize picks works, they just set numbers like this. I like doing the touchdown ones. There's obviously passing yards and, you know, is Baker Mayfield going to throw for more or less than 231 and a half pa- passing yards and uh, all of these different ones? Which would, uh, what stood out to you? Well, first off, you cooked last week. I did. You, you I, re- I, I low key think I've been pretty, I haven't, I don't, I think I put less thought into these this year and it's, it's led to. That's exactly a, how I podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I put less thought into it and I'm, I'm way better. Uh, no, there's a couple of really good ones. So one, uh, we obviously, if you watch Monday Night Football, Bengals, Jags, they might have a stable backup quarterback in Cincinnati. Jamar Chase over six receptions. He had 11 against the Jags. He's awesome. And they're just going to throw him the ball in a game that since he needs to win to stay alive. So Jamar Chase over six receptions. And then this one is the closest thing. This isn't a free square on prize picks, but my word, get this number now while it's hot. Justin Jefferson over 77 receiving yards he's 70.5 oh my god over 70.5 receiving yards justin jefferson is back the vikings need to win this game on sunday in las vegas the day after the in-season tournament championship wraps up uh i think he's gonna catch eight nine balls and he's gonna do justin jefferson stuff so um uh, please god don't let my injury bug curse two of my fantasy players but uh i think those guys are gonna cook two best wide receivers in the league not named tyree kill my fantasy team needs that, so I'm with it. Justin Jefferson back more than 75, 70 and a half. So if, yep. if all four of ours work here, we got uh, oh, more than 70 and a half receiving right yards, now. more than six receptions. Saquon Barkley not to score a touchdown. What was the other one I had? Austin Eckler not to score a touchdown. All four of those hit. You get 10 to 1 uh, on your money on a prize picks power play there. So uh, Kyle and I just find this fun and send these back and forth to each other of like, oh, look at this. This line is so dumb. <laughs> um, and it, I don't know. It's it's a fun thing to do, particularly if your your fantasy team maybe is like out of it. Um, you you're I don't know. The the Vikings aren't playing until three. Whatever. Put something together for for the noon games. It's a fun little thing to do. Throw five bucks on it or whatever. Um, and Prize Picks will throw you a one hundred dollar sign up bonus if you sign up using. The promo code Dane. So prizepicks.com, prize picks app. Hey, this was a this was a little more fun than the Raptors live show we did. It was, yeah. I don't know if the if the if the remaining audience heard that as well, but uh I saw someone say we had like six hundred people at our peak during this. I speak for I, you. I thought it was like seven hundred something. Okay. I thought it was twelve thousand. All right, shout out to everyone that subscribes and listens and supports us. Again, this is we Dane and I talk all the time offline. This has never been more fun. It's never been easier for me because it's just fun, but uh appreciate everyone that listens and subscribes and supports us supports the people that sponsor us but also too i, I need to say this because they've been killing it behind the scenes yeah cooper carlson uh does all the stuff behind the scenes on youtube and running these shows and putting the comments up there so shout out to cooper carlson who also knows hoops and yep. is a, has his own channel and is really wise about basketball and then cam cresco uh cam i hope i said that right but uh we got some cool stuff on tiktok now and instagram i i sound like 100 years old saying that but cam is as good as it gets making edits and and making little cool consumable ways when you're in a hurry and you just want to get a minute of dopamine of Timberwolves and Nas Reed footage, Cam is maybe the best in the business. So shout out to those two guys because without them, uh, I know Dane and I would be lost and old. Yeah, and the idea is like we do like five hours of Wolves, more than that, of of Wolves podcasting a week on this channel. And um, I appreciate everyone that can listen to all of them but some of them you can't and i Mm -hmm. I get that and and that's okay and the idea um with the with the tiktok and the instagram is like here's a little something you know from the episode or on youtube you can click the timestamps, and maybe it's me and brit talking for way too long but you just want to listen to me and brit talk about 
Kyle Anderson or whatever. <laughs> yeah, Go to the right. timestamp, click on it, and and do that. So we're promoting these things. We're doing these things to make more ways uh, for y'all to be able to to consume uh, the the stuff that we're doing here. So on Instagram and TikTok, it is Dane Moore MBA underscore podcast, and on the YouTube channel, there's I there's ten thousand more people that listen per episode than are subscribed to the the youtube channel um so if that if, if, even if you are just a podcast listener i'm a podcast listener i'm not i'm not a, a youtube listener when i listen to podcasts but it does help us out um just for us to get those those numbers up subscribers and followers on on those channels just because we want the stuff to be able to populate elsewhere so other people who are maybe just tapping into the wolves this season because they're good to know that this is a place to get um, a different perspective uh, on the Timberwolves, whether it be from Kyle or Britt or Jace or Chris, who are all very different, um, come at this in very different ways. And it's something I'm proud of with the channel is that like, Kyle's not for you. Maybe Chris is. If Jace isn't for you, maybe Kyle is, you know, and um, if Britt's not for goal. you, you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go to hell. Uh, but uh, but yeah, just mostly uh, grateful that we can do these things, and it's a, just a a good and flattering reminder that seven hundred some people on a Friday night are are listening to us talk or watch Kyle drink wine with a mustache. And, and I and I speak I speak for Dan on this. We'll wrap it up, but this is really fun, and this is this is unique. Uh, Dane parades these really smart, talented people on the show every week, and they all promote their writing and stuff. Uh, I don't know if you guys all had your phones on Do Not Disturb, but for some reason, WCCO had me on the news the other day to talk about, yeah. can you believe this team? Can you can, can you buy into this? And I will say, I'll speak for Dane. You said yes? <laughs> well, I compared it to falling in love and then also investing, so I don't know. I My parents were proud, but I was embarrassed. I had this rat on my above my upper lip, but... uh. I speak for you on this because you and Britt have done so much for me and taught me so much about the game and always been really honest. This team sucks for most of the time you and I have been doing this. And to see you guys all of a sudden basically politely go to war with an NBA scout to be like, I think you're wrong. I think this team is sustainable. I think this team is good. I think there is meat on the bone drink and there's more to this. And this is real, real hoops for a fan base that knows real hoops because they've had such bad years. They had to try to find the little intricacies of stats and little positives. So I'm having fun. I know you're having fun and I hop on here every day just to entertain people. So uh, subscribe, shout out to the people that support us. Um, what's your schedule next week? Are you going back? Are we, are we in it now? Cause we're in the holidays, but like, are yeah. you going to keep cooking four days a week? Yeah. Well, well next, I think next week's going to be uh, another normal one. Um, We'll have Chris on, on Monday before the Pelicans game. I think my bump Jace to Tuesday okay. again because they don't play until uh, Thursday. I think in Dallas. So yeah, this is the this is the schedule. Um, you know, sometimes Kyle might not be available or somebody else might not be available. We'll move things around, but you can you can count on uh, at least four episodes uh, a week throughout the season uh, from this team. And I think even around Christmas will stay pretty solid because Christmas is like oh, on a Monday or Sunday or something like that. So maybe we won't do it. Yeah, I think it's Christmas on Monday. Like Christmas we won't do on, it if it's on. Uh, we won't do an episode on Christmas. I promise that. But uh, yeah, this we're is gonna... all I got. Christmas is on a Monday. Yeah, whether, you, you, uh, whether you celebrate Christmas or not. Mm -hmm. But if you want to know how into this team I am, I'm flying my parents out here next week to Portland to kind of hang out a little bit before Christmas. And they're like, oh, you know, why don't you come back and use some PTO? <laughs> all my PTO right now is in the bank. Because I might be traveling around the country in April, yes. May, and June. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I had one other thing I was going to say, but now I'm tired and I'm going to I'm going to wrap need this some up. Wine. Yeah, I, tonight I probably... was a blessing. <laughs> Rudy Gobert led the league in never minds, and 17 and four, they have matched their win total from what season was it? I just tweeted this out. The 2003, 23, 24 Timberwolves are 17 and four. 2010, 11 Timberwolves were 17 and 65. That team had Kosta Kufis and Darko Milicic and Nikola Pekovic. This team's unicorns, little better. There's a big difference between Darko Milicic and and Rudy Gobert, and that's that's probably all you need to know of how how different uh, this season is. Tune in uh, Monday to find out what the difference is. 
uh kyle appreciate you doing this with me um yeah obviously you're you're already following kyle on uh on twitter for all the kyle things and you're listening to him over at at flag run howls um yeah until monday with chris he's kyle at kyle tigey i'm dane at dane more mba subscribe check us out on instagram and tiktok yeah till monday peace out